They receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. What Paul says today in 1 Corinthians 13, what he was saying to the Corinthians then, is basically he's questioning whether or not they really even love Jesus Christ. You may think that's harsh, but I would submit to you that's loving. When the ascended Jesus Christ, writing the letters to the seven churches recorded in the book of the Revelation, said to the church at Ephesus, commending them for their orthodoxy, commending them for being willing to practice redemptive, corrective church discipline, and then chided them, challenged them, when he said, you know, you, you're doing these things, you're, you're believing these things in your heads, but you've lost your first love. You don't love me. That's, that was shocking. What Paul says here today, and we went through this last Sunday just in a very cursory way and challenging you as we did to, to put yourself in this passage and then to see in this passage that it really does epitomize, it, it personifies the love of Jesus Christ. And so I want to challenge you today as we begin to look through this in a more uh, scrutinizing way to ask yourself, do I see that in Jesus? Has his love washed over me and do I see that in myself as the outworking of his love in me? First Corinthians 13, one through 13, stand with me if you would. Find that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we'll put it on the screen for you, though we really desire for you. And you know, I'm thinking if you don't have a Bible at church, I'm wondering where, where do you have a Bible, for crying out loud? Uh, you wouldn't sit in a deer blind without a weapon. You wouldn't stand on a pier without a fishing pole. This is a tool. Follow along as I read. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, or love never stops loving. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, or the more generic, when I became mature, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. We just read together the, what have we read? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And oh, how we need to see the sufficiency of the Word of God worked out in our lives concerning the reality that Christian love, not our idea, not, not our notion superimposed of but what the Scriptures teach to be Christian love, produces a loving Christian, really. Thank you. Please be seated. We said to you before as we were moving into this passage that uh, you typically will hear this read at a wedding. I won't ask you how many of you had this read at your wedding or how many of you had a wedding where the pastor chose to read this. It's typically read at a wedding, and well, and well it should be 
Because the only way a, a marriage is going to survive is if the two individuals give themselves to this love. You can't really give yourself to one another if you don't give yourself to this love. You can be married now. Two unbelievers can be married. Uh, it's creation ordinance. Better to marry than to burn. But you can't, you can't give yourself into a relationship unless you give this love into a relationship. But you see, that's not primarily what it's about. That's not why Paul wrote this. He wasn't under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing the letter to the church at Corinth, dealing with their, with their abuse and neglect of the spiritual gifts of the charismata, and then stop and say, you know, the world needs a really good flowing demonstration of love. No, he wrote 1 Corinthians 13 because of 1 Corinthians 12 and in anticipation of 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 12 speaks, of course, of the rich variety of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 14 will address the proper use of those gifts. 1 Corinthians 13 is designed to, designed to teach that it's love alone that safeguards the use of that which the Spirit has so richly provided. One commentator describes this passage as, quote, the greatest, strongest, deepest thing Paul ever wrote, end quote. Today's a day of superlatives. Tonight when we look at Philippians, I'm going to quote you uh, from someone there who talks about his Christological passage in Philippians 2, 5 to 11 as, as being superlative. So it's, it's a day of superlatives. The word used for love in this chapter is one of, the, one of three basic terms for love in the Greek language. I want to just, we've gone over this before. I do this, by the way, every time I sit down premaritally counseling someone. If I'm counseling someone in the middle of their marriage that's having marital strife, we always go through these three terms. Two of them occur in the scriptures. One does not. The one that does not is the word eros. Now, if you, if you hear if you hear English in, in language, in other languages, particularly in Greek and Latin, you'll hear a lot of that. You hear the word uh, erotic. Uh, and, that, and that's got a really bad association with it in, a, in, a, in the pornographic age we live in. Uh, and it, it's the sense in which it should. But the word itself... Uh, I like to break down these three words this way, the, the word eros, philia, and agape. Eros is, I will, I will love you if. It has the condition to it, if you please me, if you pleasure me, if you, if you fulfill my real or perceived needs, then I will love you. Now, that in and of itself is not uh, pornographic, but it is selfish. However you look at it, it's got a selfishness. It's, it's got a condition. I will love you if. Uh, sadly, many teenagers fall into this trap, and, they're, and they're, they're hurt and they're damaged. They have to work through some things. Adults fall into it as well. The, uh, the second word, philia, or philia, uh, is, is the, it, it, here's the, I love you because. It's a it's a f affection word. It's a friendship word. Uh, if if you can imagine in your mind the word phileo, adelphos, and then you begin to work with that, and you hear this Philadelphia. What is Philadelphia known as? What's the what's their tagline? The city of brotherly love, right? Because that's what Philadelphos means. <laughs> Phileo, friendly affection. Adelphos, brother. Now, it's I love you because uh, there are things that draw you out. Of maybe someone laughs at your jokes all the time, and you and you love them because they think you're funny. Maybe they. They make you feel important, and you love them because they, you can a thousand different ways, you realize. In, in James chapter 4, verse 4, 
This is the only place that this noun form, philia, uh, philia uh, occurs in the Greek New Testament. You adulterous people, do you not know that philia, that is friendship with the world, is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, I don't have this next passage on the screen, but I want you to look with me at John chapter 21. Because here's another occurrence of it. We've taught you this before, but I just want to remind you today briefly. When Jesus is with Peter in John 21, 15, he's, this is post-resurrection, pre ascension. He takes Peter aside when they'd finished breakfast and he says, Simon Peter, Simon son of John, do you agape me more than these? Now hold on to that for a minute because the next word is agape. Agape is the unconditional love. It, in fact, originally it, it meant uh, in the secular Greek, Greek outside the New Testament, it meant esteem, high esteem for. But when the Greek writers took it up under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they transformed the meaning of the word. So much so that, that one, uh, one writer said that uh, it's a word born within the bosom of revealed religion. And that's the word, by the way, that's going to occur in our, in our passage when we get to it. It's agape. It's unconditional love. If, if Eros says, I love you if, or as long as, if phileo is, I love you because, agape is, I love you regardless. I love you regardless. Jesus loves us with an everlasting love. Jesus sets his love upon us, and he never changes his mind about that. He doesn't say, well, I didn't know the relationship was going to go this way. I mean, I'm really disappointed. No, no, no. He loves. Oh, how he loves us so. Jesus loves me. This I know. But the Bible tells me so, and he loves we talked last week, John 13, having, having loved his own who were in the world, he now prepared to show them the full extent of his love. And he did that by way of object lesson and washing their feet. And he did that in the shocking experience of being nailed to the cross. That's agape. And so think about this a minute. Jesus says back in John 21, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? More, either they're more than these fishing things that Simon said, I'm going fishing again. This, this whole thing was a huge disappointment. <laughs> do you agape me more than these, these, these fishing things? Or he may be saying, Simon, do you, do you agape me more than these other men agape me? Peter's answer is instructive when you think about our three words. Yes, Lord, you know that I feel I owe you. Wait, Jesus said, do you love me unconditionally? Peter said, Lord, I love you because I love you as a friend. Peter's struggling here because he hadn't been a very good friend. He denied Jesus three times. Keep that in mind. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He speaks to him as a shepherd, as a pastor. Something I think Peter did not expect. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Peter said, yes, yes, Lord, you know that I feel I owe you. It's interesting. He couldn't bring himself to say, I agape you. You know that I feel I owe you. He said, 
tend my sheep. More, more language of a pastor. The great shepherd speaking to an under-shepherd. Remember 1 Peter 5? 1 Peter 5, he says, and, and I, a fellow follower and a shepherd. <laughs> so the third time, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I feel I owe you. There's a lot going on here. This is a sermon in and of itself, so I don't want to get too sidetracked. But folks, that's an encounter that you should be having with Jesus. The passage we read responsively. The rich young ruler wanted to, I think he had a genuine interest in eternal life. I want to grant him that. But he wanted it his way. He wanted it on his own terms. And so Jesus took his terms and choked him with them. If you read that passage. <laughs> You know the commandments. He says, no problem. I've kept all the commandments. That's not a problem. So, so that's done. Check. Commandments kept. Now what else? He said, well, you've, you've got a little house clean to do. One thing you lack. Take everything you have. Give it to the poor. And you'll have joy in heaven. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Uh, the, the one thing I was thinking about was not nearly that comprehensive, Rabbi. <laughs> I was hoping for something manageable. And he went away sorrowful. Why was he sorrowful? Maybe because he, he didn't have any guarantee from the, from the teaching Rabbi that he would have eternal life. Maybe because he faced for the first time himself. Jesus showed him he didn't agape. His interest in heaven had strings attached. And so, so this passage is, uh, is so critical for us today. As we make our way through it, this more excellent way that Paul calls it at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, I want you to see in this passage, and we'll begin unpacking this today. And I'm grateful for Dr. Curtis Vaughn, my Greek professor, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians for the outline. And by the way, if you check these outlines, a lot of commentators use a similar outline, maybe with different language. It breaks out, it lays out. Dr. Vaughn used to tell us, if you learn to diagram the Greek, you won't struggle for outlines. The Greek will just fall out like a nice, a nicely cooked piece of meat. And here it is, the necessity of love, the excellence of love, the perpetuity of love. First of all, the necessity of love. One writer said, the, the one indispensable gift is love. If one were to have all the special gifts in the highest perfection without having love, one would produce nothing, be nothing, gain nothing. Before we look at these verses, I want, you to, I want to show you something. There's some things that stand out in repetition in these verses. The word if is used five times. The word all, all mysteries, all knowledge, all faith, all I possess. I told you last week that when you get into this passage, Paul is using hyperbole here. He is exaggerating. Look at verses 1 to 3. 
If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Folks, first of all, no mere son of Adam, no mere daughter of Eve has, has all of this. We'll get into the tongues issue later on in this, in this chapter and then in chapter 14 for sure. But when you think about the tongues of men and angels, tongues of men is obvious. When I speak in the language of human beings, the tongues of angels, I simply challenge you to go into the New Testament, read everywhere that an angel speaks. In fact, add Isaiah 6 to it. I don't know how angels speak in heaven, but every time they speak on earth, they speak the language that we understand. And he says here that love is necessary to the meaningful use of the gift of tongues. He says if, it's, if there's not agape, if my speech is not agape-driven, he uses two images here that these Corinthians were very familiar with. We read those and we think about the child uh, in his bedroom where some aunt or uncle has given the child a drum set for Christmas. You know those types, don't you? You think, what can I give them? A macaw? And in the, in the, in the bedroom, the child flailing away, just <laughs> That's what we think. That's not what Paul was going after here. These folks had come out of the pagan worship. The noisy gong, the clanging cymbal was used in that context to stir and promote and provoke ecstatic experience and even to cover uh, the sounds associated with it. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, and you're going to see that by virtue of the fact that he launches with tongues first, when that was the last thing he described, Paul is telling them this is the issue at Corinth. He said, if I do this, I'm, I might as well be back in the pagan temple if love is not what drives my speech. Paul could have said, if you should speak, but he brings himself in that to, to soften the blow. And in doing so, he is setting the example of love and humility. He says, if I should do this, I have no grounds for this. For me to make claim to that by virtue of being an apostle of Jesus Christ, whether present with you or writing to you, you should receive my words as you would receive a noisy gong and a clamoring cymbal. as just so much noise. Tongues and their interpretation were mentioned last in the previous list that Paul gave. He leads off with speaking in tongues. This supports the view that an overemphasis on this gift was at the heart of the problem under discussion. And he says, even if we were to do this in the most exalted way, and yet it's not, it doesn't flow from love, from agape love. Unselfish love. Concerned for others' love. Not thinking more highly of myself than I do of others' type of love. He said, if that's not what's driving it, 
then where's the value? And this is, this, at, at Corinth, apparently this is what they were doing. They were saying, well, look, I, you know, I, isn't it wonderful? But I have, I have the gift of tongues. I have this uh, heavenly prayer language that I engage in. Do you? Implication being that if you don't, then how can you think you're spiritual? We're going to look at that in 14. Love is necessary, secondly, to the effective use of the gift of prophecy. And if I have prophetic powers, verse 2, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. This is hyperbole here. Who, other than Jesus Christ himself, claim that in his prophetic voice, he had access to the capacity to understand all mysteries. Remember the word mystery in our English, you've got to remember this. We, we read that. It's the word in the Greek, musterion. It just comes to us from Greek. It's not translated here. It's transliterated. Mystery is musterion. It's, the, it's that which has previously been hidden but it's now been revealed, the, un, the unveiling of the mystery. In the New Testament, uh, very often, uh, though the mystery is God in the flesh, that's part of it, but there's also the mystery of the gospel going to the Gentiles as Gentile. And he says, but if I have, if I understand all, every aspect of the mysteries, and if I have all knowledge, and he can't be, he knows he doesn't, because at the end of this, one day he says, we see now, we see in part, and one day we will see face to face. So he's using hyperbole here. Knowing and declaring the will of God, that's the, that's the prophetic gift. We looked at that already. Knowing mysteries, possessing knowledge. They're not additional to the prophetic gift. They're the, they're the outworking of it. They're part of it. Paul is, if you want to give a summary here, Paul is likely piling up the words for what one writer calls rhetorical effect, and in effect saying, if I know everything there is to know. Now think about this for a minute. You know, our, our minds were, were harmed at the fall. Before the fall, Adam and Eve had complete use of their minds. He named the entire animal and plant and geological system. Think about that for a minute. After the fall, there was a shattering of the Imago Dei, the image of God upon the, upon the, the human being. So we're going to grant for the sake of argument, that you and I have and are exercising 5% of the use of our minds. By the way, if you are, you're the most brilliant person we will have ever met. Paul's saying, if I know everything there is to know. Because apparently in, in Corinth, there was this sort of occultic knowledge mentality that I know more than you. And folks who embrace the Reformed faith need to be very careful because sometimes we come across as Gnostics. I know something you don't know. And the important thing is to know someone. He's chiding them here. Hyperbole. In the third place, love is necessary to the value of faith. 1 Corinthians 13, second part of verse 2. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. This wonder-working faith. Spoke of it. He said, if you say to the mountain, be cast into sea. And it happens. And we read that. And how do you respond to that when you read that in the Gospels? I know I respond by, dear God, increase my faith. 
too often, I don't know if you've read Pilgrim's Progress recently or not, but too often I feel like the character Little Faith. And Paul in hyperbole here to chide the Corinthian arrogance. The using or abusing of the spiritual gifts in order to demonstrate superiority to others. We have all faith. Wonder working faith. But it's not originating from agape love. Now, notice the progression here. It profits me nothing to I am nothing. Because he knows there's an enemy of our souls who loves to masquerade and people who are always looking for a sign, wanting to be able to practice a sign or experience a sign, that the enemy of our souls has them right where he wants them in his grasp. And he would love to distract. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. He would love to to, to tantalize you and me with miracles. If in doing that, he can distract us from the core, which is agape. And there are people out there chasing miracles, building ministries on miracles, who are not chasing Jesus and wanting the agape love of Jesus that he has shown to us. We've, we've sung these songs today that express that so powerfully. And in showing it to us that we, it, it flows into us and from us. Well, the temptation is to, is to chase rabbits. But not really rabbits and not really chase them, but skin them. You see, this notion... There are multitudes of people. Do you realize this? Multitudes of people who imagine they love Jesus. Imagine they have been on the receiving end of this remarkable love of Jesus who do not love what Jesus loves. The love of Jesus doesn't flow from them. So they don't love their spouses. It's Christ loves the church. They don't love their children. God loves his children. They don't love the church. They do not love the church. Deal with it. It's a reality. Stop, stop sugarcoating it and painting over it. They don't love the church. But they imagine they love Jesus. And at the end, it's going to be horrifying for the multitudes of professing believers who were cast into hell because they did not love what Jesus loved. There's no excuse for it. And it's a phenomenon unique to the West. You don't find Christians in the, in the persecuted countries of the world who have this personal love affair with Jesus and love nothing else that he loves. It's just not a reality. It's only in the West. That's why I say from time to time, I think what needs to happen here is a good, healthy dose of persecution. America needs to enter the top 50 and have the winds of persecution blow over us, burn through us, and burn away the chaff that masquerades as the church. To have all faith. Fourth, love is necessary to make deeds of mercy and sacrifice meaningful. This, this is astounding. Listen to this. If I give away all I have, by the way, what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. Jesus knew what his response was going to be. I mean, Jesus did not put himself in the dilemma, well, what if he had? No, Jesus knew what his response was going to be. He wasn't saying that so he would find out. He was saying that to let the man be exposed to himself. If I give away all that I have, and yet it's not driven by agape love. I gain nothing. This man said, what good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? I gain nothing. If I deliver up my body to be burned, martyrdom, martyrdom. If I face and experience the prospect of death in the name 
of the cause of Christ. And it does not flow from, is not motivated by agape love, unconditional love to him, unconditional love toward his enemies. If it's not there, <laughs> it was an amazing, amazingly, apparently amazingly unselfish act. And the beginning and the end of the amazingness of it is right there in the act. This is shocking. It is shocking. And Paul is wanting to shock the Corinthians out of their party spirit, out of their selfishness, out of actions and attitudes and words that are undermining the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the city of Corinth. When you read through this, I read this and I tremble. I just tremble, dear God, because, because I speak as an under-shepherd. I have been given the gift of prophetic utterance, not of, not of foretelling, not of predicting the future, but of telling forth, of attempting to accurately communicate the revealed Word of God. And I look at that. And I pray, dear God, do I do that out of love? Because if not, I'm wasting your time and mine. If you teach, and it's not driven by agape, you're wasting your time, and you're wasting the time of those who are taking time to, to sit under that, if you, if, you, if you give, yet it's done begrudgingly. Remember, we talk a lot in here about how God loves it. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians as well. God loves a hilarious giver. That's the uh, hilasterion. If you give begrudgingly, if you give, you've bought into some of the lies of the, of the prosperity that you give so you can get. Well, if I give this, maybe I'll get... If you give like you're, like you're paying God off. <laughs> Nothing. And while at this moment none of us are in danger of being arrested and executed for being a Christian, doesn't mean it won't ever happen. You see, how do, you, how do you respond to this passage? Because Paul's just getting started. He's, he's using hyperbole of himself to, to expose some of the gross functional error being committed in Corinth. Imagine how he would write this to the church in the West today. It would, it would wilt us, I believe, brothers and sisters. Because we think we can date Jesus. We can get everything we want out of Jesus without giving anything of ourselves to him. That's a devil's lie. And as best I can tell, looking at things, reading things, watching things, he sold it pretty well to the West. He sold it pretty well to the West. So we leave it here today because we, we, need to, we need to pick up Sunday, Lord willing, with this next section the, where he dives into some, a descriptive, the excellence of love. He said, I'm going to show you a more excellent way in 1 Corinthians 12. He is, he is hypothesized for the, for the use of hyperbole, these, these things, if I, if I, if I, if I. Now he's going to tell us, here's, here's what love looks like. Here's what love looks like. And here's what it doesn't look like. The presence of love means that there will be things. The presence of love means there will be the absence of some things. So I encourage you to read through verses 4 to 7 and get your heart ready for us to dive into this next Sunday, Lord willing, to see the excellence of love. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, 
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, we read these opening words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth, and it is, they're, they're withering. They're withering. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, even now. Deliver us from false notions, from the idea that we can decide what love to Jesus and love to others looks like when you have spelled it out and just grip us anew and afresh that the great commandment has been and still is love the Lord your God with all of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. And help us to see with gratitude that Jesus Christ did and does love this way. And as we answer the question, do you, do you love me? Help us to come face to face with our love of Christ. And in doing that, come face to face with the question of the disciples, and then who, who? Who can be saved? Who can be saved? And the answer is, with, with man, it's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. Oh, help us to leave this place today with a great gratitude that you love us, that Jesus loves us. And respond to that in love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.